By mid-2009, after seven years of marriage, Lucy Landry began an affair with Gareth Jenkins, an old school friend she reconnected with on Facebook. She was tired of the 24-year age difference with her husband and his controlling nature, which had left her increasingly lonely and disillusioned. She asked her husband for a divorce and demanded that he, who was suffering from prostate cancer, pay 6,000 pounds for a new flat for her and Mr. Jenkins to move into. The pair started to row constantly over money. On February 1st, in the presence of a neighbor, Lucy taunted her husband about naked photographs he had taken of himself three months previously, which she had found on his computer, calling him a pervert and taunting him that he should be on the sex offender's register. That night, they argued violently, following each other around the house, shouting and taunting each other over money, possessions, and Mr. Jenkins. The fight ended in a way that no one expected. Lucy Davies was born in 1971 in the county of Rhonda, England. She was the daughter of Roger and Andrea Davies, who were also the proud parents of another girl named Anna. The family was settled in a small community mainly formed by socially purposed housing. There, against the backdrop of beautiful mountain scenery, Lucy had a particularly happy childhood. Since she and her little sister had similar tastes, they were always very close. Her parents always highlighted Lucy's infectious joy as a standout quality. During her time in primary school, Lucy was known for her outgoing and likable temperament, which immediately endeared her to teachers and classmates alike. In addition to her charming personality, she was also recognized for her undeniable beauty, making her one of the most popular and admired girls at school. Regarding interests outside of academics, both she and Anna loved ponies. Knowing this, their father pleasantly surprised them by enrolling both in the local riding club. This sporting activity taught them discipline and also showcased their talent. Consequently, they earned the right to participate and represent the club in countless events and competitions. Thus, by the start of secondary school, Lucy shone as an exceptional rider. However, her energy and passion were not limited to the tracks, as the versatile young lady began to take flute and piano lessons, dedicating long hours to practice to master both instruments. Her efforts soon paid off, and by the following year, Lucy had a very comprehensive and detailed mastery of the wide field of classical music. Thanks to this, she was accepted into a youth orchestra and also joined her school's choir group. As often happens in this stage of adolescence, a healthy romantic interest appeared in her life and Lucy became very close to Gareth Jenkins. However, she preferred to keep it a secret. In 1989, after finishing secondary school, Lucy was determined to pursue a career in the musical world. With that goal in mind, she enrolled to undertake a bachelor's degree at the University of Warwick. There, she began her new and promising life, always with the aspiration of becoming a teacher and dedicating herself to musical education. But things did not go as she had expected. While her passion remained, she did not enjoy the direction of the degree program. Consequently, she decided to switch her original plan and opted to study urban planning. It was around this time that she met Graeme McAllister. They both discovered quite soon that their outlook on life was very similar. Aside from their love for art and shared interests, a crucial detail in their bond was the extravagant sense of humor that complemented each other. Their relationship flowed naturally, and as they made plans for the future, Lucy decided to introduce him to her parents. For Roger and Andrea, 
The meeting was wonderful, as they were certain that Graham was the right one for their daughter. So much so that they decided to buy Lucy a house in the city of Coventry, northwest of London. This gesture, in addition to ensuring her a life free from the upheavals of rent and moving, carried their wish for her to start a family. Shortly after moving in, Lucy invited her boyfriend to share the new home. As they continued with their studies in 1995, the young couple welcomed their first child, whom they named James. Lucy decided it was best to take a break from university to care for him. Meanwhile, Graham continued with his university commitments and, to support the household expenses, got a job working the night shift at the city's postal sorting office. Over the months, this dynamic began to affect Lucy because alone at home, dedicated exclusively to the child, and with many hours away from her partner, a feeling of boredom took hold of her. Then, she found no better solution than to explore internet chat rooms for distraction. In this universe, she sought to meet new people. One night, while Lucy was immersed in lively conversations in various chat rooms, she came into contact with Harold Landry, at 53 years old and of American origin, Harold came from a financially struggling family in Louisiana. However, he understood early on that, being just one among a dozen siblings, he would have to achieve everything through his own effort and will. Thus, from a young age, he dedicated himself to hard work to escape poverty. His opportunity arrived when he realized that in the oil business, the key was not in owning a well, but in providing the essential infrastructure for the owners of such fields. Consequently, he founded his own company, focused exclusively on the design and manufacture of hydraulic equipment for major oil companies in the southern United States. As he had anticipated, the business allowed him to amass a great fortune, eventually reaching billionaire status. By that time, he divided his time between his eccentric hobbies and a property on the island of Cozumel in Mexico. On a personal level, he had been married and divorced twice. From these unions, he had children whose exact number and identities are not publicly known. What was known, however, was that Harold made sure they lacked nothing. A particularly relevant event occurred in 1992 when, being single again, he met a married woman 20 years his junior, however. Neither her family nor her husband were obstacles for Harold, who directed all his seductive strategy towards her and won her over. On February 6, 1994, Harold picked her up to take her for a ride in New Orleans. For this occasion, they hired a babysitter. After concluding the evening, Harold accompanied his lover back to her home and offered to take the babysitter back to hers. No one seemed concerned about the fact that the husband would find out about the betrayal and could act as a wounded man. In fact, that's exactly what happened. Outside the residence, the betrayed husband was monitoring every move of his wife. Once the third party said goodbye, he followed him in his car. A few minutes later, Harold finally noticed the vehicle tailing him. Then, almost as an instinctive gesture, he opened the glove compartment and pulled out the firearm he usually kept. When both stopped at a red light, things spiraled out of control, as the babysitter later narrated. Harold then brandished a revolver at the betrayed husband and fired. The bullet severed an artery in his neck and damaged a nerve leading to a vocal cord. The husband called Chris Price, collapsed on the pavement with a wound on his neck, but fortunately, there was a hospital right in front of them, which allowed him to receive immediate aid, and the doctors were able to save his life. As for Harold, he was arrested and charged with attempted murder. The trial against him took place in 1997. In his opening statement, the defense attorney, told the jury that Chris had only been the victim of a tragic and sordid affair. Regarding his client, he mentioned that he acted out of fear and in self-defense. 
The defense's clever strategy led the jury, consisting of four men and eight women, to find Harold guilty of the lesser charge of aggravated assault. As a result, he was sentenced to five years behind bars. After appealing, Harold obtained probation. In exchange, he had to pay a fine of $500 and fulfill community service obligations. Although he sought to be completely exonerated, he thanked Pat for his hard work. Since then, they became great friends. Shortly after, Harold and Chris agreed on an undisclosed settlement amount. By the time Harold began talking with Lucy, he was residing in Covington and was still wealthy enough not to have to work. He was also honest about his occupations and everything related to his past life, including love affairs and legal details. But all these elements only served to increase Lucy's attraction to him. What followed was an engaging online romance, with Harold promising her a more than tempting lifestyle. His persistence and persuasive power bore fruit when Lucy finally asked Graham to end their relationship. Thus, he had the path clear, without a rival that could cause him trouble as had happened with Chris. With the wind in his favor in the early 2000s, Harold traveled to England to meet her, and she took the opportunity to introduce him to her parents as her boyfriend. Although Roger and Andrea were surprised by the significant age difference, they respected their daughter's decisions and did not object to the relationship. Feeling fulfilled and fortunate to share his life with her, Harold spared no effort to surprise her, whether with luxurious gifts or anything else Lucy desired. In fact, by then, he was so in love that he was already planning to propose marriage. However, he didn't want it to be just any proposal. He wished to do it in an ideal setting. To achieve this goal, he took her, along with her son James, and included Graham in the group on a trip. The chosen destination was Mexico, which for Harold was by then his favorite place in the world. Additionally, his longtime friend Pat, who had been his attorney in the past trial, also had an apartment close to his residence, which added to the feeling of comfort. Initially, Harold bought a diamond ring and shared the news with enthusiasm with Pat. Nonetheless, his friend harbored certain suspicions about his future fiance. Moreover, over the days, Pat found it strange that Lucy had dedicated a good part of her time in the company of Graham. He seemed to be completely blind to it and, ultimately, he proceeded with his plan to propose. Lucy happily accepted the proposal, and in mid-2003, the couple celebrated their union. Shortly afterward, Harold surprised her by acquiring a million-dollar property in an exclusive neighborhood in Worcestershire. In this rural setting, the marriage had a prosperous and peaceful start, further favored by the presence of excellent neighbors like Rachel Clark and Stephen Kennedy, with whom Harold and Lucy formed a lovely friendship. Soon, the newlyweds had their first daughter, whom they named Harriet. The event filled both Lucy and Harold with joy, and from then on, he dedicated himself to the little girl with undiminished energy and commitment. Equally important and affectionate was the relationship he maintained with James, whom he treated as if he were his own son. But relentless time began to erode their initial bliss. Gradually, the demands made towards Lucy increased, and her moodiness became directly proportional to her husband's demands. As he saw it, his wife was to constantly adjust to his preferences and adopt a submissive role to his requests. She, on the other hand, had different expectations, so tensions quickly became apparent. As a conclusion, Lucy was direct and unafraid to express her thoughts, and in this dynamic, her husband was not willing to yield. With both having volatile personalities, their arguments often culminated in explosive breakups, followed by reconciliation once the storm had passed. Thus, moments that had once been pleasurable, like the children's vacations, became increasingly marred by fights. Meanwhile, James witnessed the disintegration of his mother and stepfather's relationship. To their neighbor's dismay, the disputes that stretched on for hours became a sort of regular soundtrack. By that time, 
Rachel and Stephen were aware that the couple had a tendency to abuse alcohol, knowing well that this was the fuel that ignited their shouting and complaints. When Lucy and Harold unleashed all their anger, leading to prolonged periods of not speaking to each other, their neighbors felt peace return. In mid-2009, thanks to social media, Lucy reconnected with Gareth. Having had no contact since their platonic love in secondary school, they caught up and chatted for hours, with necessary interruptions due to both of their commitments. After Harold went to sleep, his wife stayed in front of the screen. Soon, it became evident to him that, feeling unhappy, his wife had resorted to the same escape route through which she had found him, and he had no doubt she was looking for a replacement. However, far from confronting her, he considered giving her some space and traveled to Mexico, where he stayed for a while. Meanwhile, Lucy took the opportunity to invite Gareth to stay with her. In the autumn of 2009, her husband returned to England, thinking this time would resolve their marriage. But as soon as he stepped into the house, Lucy asked him for a divorce. Initially, he felt devastated. Then, after a few weeks, Harold began a relationship. He met this new woman online. She lived in the vicinity and went by the name of Rachel. Parallel to each of their new romances, the divorce negotiations were underway. And as often happens, new conflicts emerged. Especially concerning the house, Lucy expected to keep it to ensure a roof over her children's heads. For Harold, on the other hand, this matter was non-negotiable. His solution was to offer her money to buy herself a more modest apartment on her own. At the same time, he completely excluded her from his will. Upon learning of the decisions of her still husband, Lucy flew into a rage. Her feelings of hatred towards him made her share everything about Harold's past with her son James, not leaving anything out. Amidst the complicated process and considering the evident tension she was living in, Gareth invited her to spend a few days with him in Wales. Upon her return to familiar surroundings, Lucy no longer wished to disguise or hide her lengthy phone conversations with her new love. Meanwhile, both she and Harold were immersed in excessive alcohol consumption. The arguments escalated to unexpected heights, leaving the children at the mercy of a violent and unbearable atmosphere. On the afternoon of Monday, February 1, 2010, Harold drank several glasses of wine. At one point, he received a package intended for Stephen. Around 9 o'clock at night, when Stephen returned from work, he found a postal notification indicating that his parcel had been delivered to his neighbor. The Landry's lights were on, so he went there. Harold invited him in and served him a glass of wine. After greeting Lucy and exchanging a few words, Stephen noticed how drunk his host was. He took his package, excused himself, and left. Subsequently, the couple engaged in a nonsensical argument, specifically over a furniture purchase she was planning for their move. James acted as the years of fights had taught him. This time, the disagreement escalated to a physical altercation. In the scuffle, Harold grabbed a kitchen utensil with which he struck Lucy on the cheek. Unable to continue avoiding the facts, James appeared at the scene of the dispute and found his mother injured. He immediately called the police and then focused on securing his younger sister's safety. Not long after, Lucy and her children left the house seeking help. The first place she thought to go was to Stephen's house. However, just as she headed in that direction, Harold caught up to her and, with a knife, caused her multiple injuries. Then he left her under a bush in the garden and walked away. Alerted by the screams, Stephen went outside. It only took him a few steps to discover his neighbor. Although he initially thought she was unconscious, he quickly understood the severity of the situation. At that moment, responding to the emergency call, the police arrived at the scene. They called the paramedics and searched the vicinity for the perpetrator. However, they only found the children, hidden and terrified in the backyard amidst the darkness. Once on site, 
The paramedics acted as quickly as possible, and Lucy was transported to the hospital. Very shortly after, her heart stopped. Meanwhile, Harold went to Rachel's house and confessed that something terrible had happened, but without giving further details. He then gave her three bank drafts totaling $40,000, a sum of cash, the keys to his car, and several signed blank checks. Then he set off back home. By that time, several police patrols were trying to locate him. Eventually, they found him walking along the road and proceeded to arrest him. Roger and Andrea were overwhelmed with despair upon hearing the tragic news. In a statement shared by the police, they asked for respect during their time of unimaginable sorrow from losing their daughter. For now, they had nothing more to say to the media. From then on, all their attention was focused on looking after their grandchildren. The forensic examination confirmed that Lucy had died as a result of multiple stab wounds to the chest. With this evidence and having James as a first-hand witness on February 5, 2010, Harold appeared before the court and was charged with murder. The trial took place in early February 2011. It was presided over by Judge David Foskett. On this occasion, Pat was not the defender of his friend. That task fell to attorney Andy Childs. Despite the evident difficulty of his task, the defense attorney argued that his client had been provoked by the fury of his wife, who left him no alternative but to act as he did. During his initial statements from the stand, Harold, amid sobs, stated that he loved Lucy and regretted his actions. He then adhered to the strategy laid out by his lawyer, admitting to involuntary manslaughter because, in his words, Lucy had pushed him to the limit. To highlight the violence of the case, the prosecution presented a very detailed animation of the multiple injuries suffered by the victim. This presentation was shocking to those present in the courtroom. Finally, on February 24, 2011, after less than four hours of deliberation, the jury found Harold Landry guilty of the murder of his wife, Lucy Landry, who was 38 years old at the time of her death, while Harold was 64. The following day was for the judge to impose the sentence. He had harsh words for Harold, whose attack he described as indescribable and unforgivable. He also dismissed Harold's claims of possible provocation by Lucy, considering them a vain attempt by the defendant to save himself. Consequently, he was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 16 years before being eligible for parole. By that time, however, he would be over 80 years old. Lucy's loved ones thank not only for the resolution, but also for the judge's remarks, which they felt almost perfectly expressed what they themselves felt. They noted that the sentence somehow helped alleviate the pain of their loss, although they also admitted that no number of years in prison for Harold would bring back Lucy's life, so they would have to work on accepting this painful reality. For his part, Harold insisted on proclaiming his innocence, as he was heard saying, he hoped to be able to appeal the sentence in the future. And that's the case for today. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. See you soon.